Uh oh, Abraham. He's of extreme importance in the Bible because he's a central character to the biblical narrative. And it's through Abraham that this God of the Bible gives the promises and the blessings. Right? And Abraham is said to have come originally from Ur of the Chaldees or the Chaldeans, from which his father Terah moved into Haran. Right? And then he eventually dies there. And then from there, Abraham is uh, called by this God to leave this place. Right? And then he continues into the land of Canaan. Uh, because this God is supposed to make of him a great nation. And so he heard the voice and he did just that, right? It was Abraham, Sarah, his uh, lot, his nephew, and a few other servants that uh, he had with him. And so Sarah at the age of 90 gave birth to Isaac, right? And then Isaac was uh, to be used by the God of the Bible to test Abraham's faith by getting Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. Right. And so Abraham, when he was going to do it, he heard the voice of the Lord who came and told him to put down the knife and not to slay his son. Right. And so because he was faithful, he was blessed. And so I want you to think about the underlying meaning of this story. Right. And so the character Isaac, eventually he became a man. Right. And then uh, he fathered his son named Jacob. Right. With Rebecca. Right. And then Jacob's name was changed to Israel, who then became the father of the Israelite people. Right. And so the Israelite people, they're the primary focus of the biblical narrative. Right. And that's because um, they're the people who are favored by this deity. Right. And that's throughout all the stories, um, especially in the Old Testament. And so this is just how important Abraham's position is to this story. Right. Because without Abraham, you don't have any of the blessings. Right. And ultimately, no claim to the land. Right. And you have people like the European Jews in 1948 who use this biblical narrative as a basis to state claim to the land right over there in the Middle East. Right. And so wouldn't it be important for us to understand whether or not Abraham actually existed? Absolutely. Right. And so for us to do that, we need to go into the archaeological records to see what has been discovered. And to do that, we need to open up the book, The Bible on Earth, which is already opened up and see if we can get some understanding. Before we describe the likely time and historical circumstances in which the Bible's patriarchal narrative was initially woven together from earlier sources, it is important to explain why so many scholars over the last hundred years have been convinced that the patriarchal narratives were at least in outline historically true. The pastoral lifestyle of the patriarchs seemed to mesh well in very general terms with what early 20th century archaeologists observed of contemporary Bedouin life in the Middle East. We talked about this before on how the earlier scholars and archaeologists were on a mission not to disprove the Bible, but rather they were convinced that this narrative uh, was historically accurate, right? And so they approached their scholarship from that position. Right. And we're talking more specifically about the scholars in the early parts of the 1900s. Right. And in before. Right. And so from their observations, the Bible seemed to have been accurately describing the settings and the lifestyle of the period that the patriarchs are said to have lived. And it seemed to have matched the Bedouin or the, the desert roaming nomadic people's life in some general way. Right. And we'll touch on this general way in a bit, so keep that in mind. The scholarly idea that the Bedouin way of life was essentially unchanged over millennia lent an air of verisimilitude to the biblical tales of wealth measured in sheep and goats, clan conflicts with settled villagers over watery wells, and disputes over grazing lands. In addition, the conspicuous references to Mesopotamian and Syrian sites like Abraham's birthplace Ur and Haran on a tributary of the Euphrates, where most of Abraham's family continued to live after his migration to Canaan, seemed to correspond with the findings of archaeological excavations in the eastern arc of the Fertile Crescent, where some of the earliest centers of ancient Near Eastern civilization had been found. And so all these things were pointing toward the direction of the Bible being historically accurate. But there are some very important factors that were heavily influencing the conclusions that the scholars were reaching at that time, right? And to no surprise of ours, it was these. Yet there was something much deeper, much more intimately connected with modern religious belief that motivated the scholarly search for the historical patriarchs. Many of the early biblical archaeologists had been trained as clerics or theologians. 
They were persuaded by their faith that God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the birthright of the Jewish people and the birthright passed on to Christians, as the apostle Paul explained in his letter to the Galatians, was real. Uh-oh, we have serious conflict of interest, don't we? Right? Many of the earlier biblical archaeologists had been trained as clerics or who are priests and uh, religious leaders, and they were also trained as theologians, right? Those who study the nature of God and religious beliefs, right? And Dr. Uh, Finkelstein and Dr. Silverman, they say that these people were persuaded, right, by that faith, right, of some deity who came down from the clouds and gave the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so when they went and did their excavations, these ideas were uh, motivating their interpretations and their findings, right? And it skewed them because some of them really thought that these stories were real. And if it was real, it was presumably given to real people, not imaginary creations of some anonymous ancient scribe's pen. The French Dominican biblical scholar and archaeologist Roland Devaux noted, for example, that if the historical faith of Israel is not founded in history, such faith is erroneous, and therefore our faith is also. He knew that if he didn't find real evidence of these people in the Bible, then their faith was in vain, right? And in that case, they would be believing something that was strictly in the world of imagination. Uh-oh, and that's a terrifying thing for some people to face, right? Which is why um, some people have no business watching these type of uh, videos because the information may just be too much to deal with with that current mentality that they have, right? And so let's keep going. Indeed, from the early decades of the 20th century, with the great discoveries in Mesopotamia and the intensification of archaeological activity in Palestine, many biblical historians and archaeologists were convinced that new discoveries could make it likely, if not completely prove, that the patriarchs were historical figures. They argued that the biblical narratives, even if compiled at a relatively late date, such as the period of the United Monarchy, preserved at least the main outlines of an authentic ancient historical reality. Right, and remember that this is the thinking in the earlier uh, decades of the 20th century or the 1900s. Indeed, the Bible provided a great deal of specific chronological information that might help. First of all, pinpoint exactly when the patriarchs lived. The Bible narrates the earliest history of Israel in sequential order from the patriarchs to Egypt, to Exodus, to the wandering in the desert, to the conquest of Canaan, to the period of the judges, and to the establishment of the monarchy. It also provided a key to calculating specific dates. The most important clue is the note in 1 Kings 6, 1, that the Exodus took place 480 years before the construction of the temple began in Jerusalem, in the fourth year of the reign of Solomon. Furthermore, Exodus 12.40 states that the Israelites endured 430 years of slavery in Egypt before the Exodus. Adding a bit over 200 years for the overlapping lifespans of the patriarchs in Canaan before the Israelites left for Egypt, we arrive at a biblical date of around 2100 BCE for Abraham's original departure for Canaan. Of course, there were some clear problems with accepting this dating for precise historical reconstruction not the least of which were the extraordinary long lifespans of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which all far exceeded a hundred years. Abraham is supposed to have lived to 175, Isaac to 180, Jacob to 147 years before they gave up the ghost, right? And they lived some very extended lives according to the Bible. Ooh! The American scholar Albright, however, argued that certain unique details in the stories in Genesis might hold the key to verifying their historical basis. Elements such as personal names, unusual marriage customs, and land purchase laws might be identified in the records of 2nd millennium BCE Mesopotamian societies, from which the patriarchs reportedly came. No less important, the patriarchs were realistically described as carrying on a Bedouin lifestyle, moving with their flocks throughout the central hill country of Canaan, between Shechem, Bethel, Beersheba, and Hebron. All these elements convinced Albright that the age of the patriarchs was a real one. He and his colleagues thus began to search for evidence for the presence of pastoral groups of Mesopotamian origin roaming throughout Canaan around 2000 BCE. So they were trying any and everything to fit the patriarchs within the historical framework and understand that Dr. Albert Albright, 
was no slack, right? He was the real deal. He pioneered some of the uh, earlier excavation techniques in the 20th century. And so he was extremely talented, right? And so he and his team went on a mission to find um, evidence for those claims with hopes of officially sticking the patriarchs into the history books, right? And so that's what the mission they were on. And so with all the hopes and all the talents and zeal for the Lord that they had when they went out on these sites digging, this is what happened as a result. Yet the search for the historical patriarchs was ultimately unsuccessful since none of the periods around the biblically suggested date provided a completely compatible background to the biblical stories. The assumed westward migration of groups from Mesopotamia toward Canaan, the so-called Amorite migration, in which Albright placed the arrival of Abraham and his family, was later shown to be illusory. Archaeology completely disproved the contention that a sudden, massive population movement had taken place at that time. And so the search for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was unsuccessful, right? And we can't forget that these earlier investigators, they had a zeal for the Lord, right? And so they gave it their best shot and they tried, right? And they tried to make these stories be as historically accurate as possible, right? And believe one thing, that if any Christian, theologian, or cleric would have found uh, actual evidence for these patriarchs, then nobody in the world would have not known about this discovery, right? It would have been on every single network, right? On every channel possible, every newspaper, everything, right? Finally, we have real proof of Abraham in the Bible, right? I can see the title right now as the headline, right? But since nothing has been found, the information like we're um, going into right now is almost like underground knowledge, right? And we don't see it in many places and the common person doesn't really hear about it. And so many of them get angry when they hear this type of information. Why? Because it rocks their world, right? And it shakes up many of their beliefs and, and, and what they think of as reality. And so uh, that can be a scary thing for many people. And so Albright and others, they did their very best to help the Bible-based community. Right, but ultimately the evidence prevailed. And the seeming parallels between Mesopotamian laws and customs of the second millennium BCE and those described in the patriarchal narratives were so general that they could apply to almost any period in ancient Near Eastern history. Juggling dates did not help the matter. Subsequent attempts by DeVoe to place the narratives of the patriarchs in the Middle Bronze Age, 2000 to 1550 BCE, by the American scholars Spezer and Gordon to place them against the background of a 15th century BCE archive found in Nuzi in northern Iraq, and by the Israeli biblical historian Benjamin Mazar to place them in the early Iron Age also failed to establish a convincing link. The highlighted parallels were so general that they could be found in many periods. The whole enterprise created something of a vicious circle. Scholarly theories about the age of the patriarchs whose historical existence was never doubted, changed according to the discoveries from the mid-third millennium BCE to the late third millennium, to the early second millennium, to the mid-second millennium, to the early Iron Age. Right, and so uh, we could see that many different dates were attempted, and I mean, um, they tried everything, right, that they could possibly do to fit these uh, narrative into an actual historical context. Right. And I'm glad that they did. Right. I'm sincerely glad that they tried and they gave it their best shot. Right. But apparently they were looking in the wrong direction. Right. And sometimes you have to have a fresh set of eyes on a problem before it can be solved. The main problem was that the scholars who accepted the biblical accounts as reliable mistakenly believed that the patriarchal age must be seen one way or the other as the earliest phase in a sequential history of Israel. They thought that the writings of the patriarchs were the first writings from the Israelite people, right? But the evidence in today's time, it points to that not being the truth, right? And so it's important for us to understand that um, the people writing about Abraham, these people are writing about this character many, many centuries after he said to have existed, right? And so that's extremely important for us to know. And the writers, they left many clues that this is the fact, right? That they're writing at a much later uh, period. Right, and so we'll go over some of these archaeological clues in the next video, and you'll be surprised. So this is the end of part three commentary on the book here, The Bible Unearthed by Dr. Finkelstein and Dr. Silverman. And so I want to thank you for watching until the end. My name is Brooklyn St. Michael, and I'll catch you on the next video.